Pardon the interruption, but I'm Pablo Torre, and to be invited back must mean that you really, really like me, Tony. I'm Tony Kornheiser, or that it's late summer and we're on ESPN2. Like, those are oh. your choices. Yeah, yeah. This is a tough way to learn about the two part. Um, yeah. I thought I was getting the big show call up. I haven't been on this show in such a long time. Big show call up. You're lucky you're not DFA. What are you talking about? <laughs> big show call up. Oh, Love sorry. CTI, Thank you for the boys and girls. Yeah. Yeah. Will Bond is ducking me, so I'm happy to be joined by our great friend of the new podcast. Get this, kids. Pablo Torre finds out Mr. Pablo Torre. Scraps. Is that the name of it? Pablo Torre it finds is. out. Is that the new name? The sign still works, but w the name. W now, you still go to www.pablo.show. All the W's, All but right. you know. Anyway, we begin today with the 49ers trading Trey Lance to the Cowboys over the weekend. The 49ers had famously traded up to get Lance out of North Dakota State a couple of years ago. The Cowboys have famously given Dak Prescott a ton of money. So, Pablo, what do you make of the Niners' decision to move Lance and the Cowboys' decision to acquire him? There is so much in this story, Tony. I'll start with the Niners because you rarely see any of this happen. You rarely see a team this good trade up three first-rounders to get Trey Lance in the first place. They're never usually that desperate. And when they are that desperate, they're usually reluctant to admit defeat like this. But they're so good that they have to admit defeat like this. Kyle Shanahan has, had, Kyle Shanahan has been looking for someone to elevate his offense, to raise the ceiling on an offense whose floor is so high. But because Trey Lance just hasn't played, because he got hurt, because he struggled, they're just too close to a Super Bowl to try and roll the dice with him again. And so they ate a giant sunk cost here that pretty much every other team I can imagine would refuse to eat. And so I admire them for admitting defeat so publicly. And the Cowboys thing, it just makes me laugh. I don't know what your reaction was, but I'm like, oh, thank you, Jerry Jones, for feeding the buffet that is our business. So I'm going to agree with you completely on this. I applaud the 49ers for offloading Trey Lance, for saying, you're not as good as the number one guy we got, and you're not even as good as Sam Darnold at number two. So no. we're going to get you out of here as soon as possible. I know a lot of people are going to say, well, they traded up. But Pablo, as you know, teams trade up all the time for quarterbacks. Carolina Panthers just traded up to get a quarterback. We'll see how he does this year. A few years back, Wilbon went crazy about this. Chicago Bears traded up to get Mitch Trubisky. That didn't work out. So to me, to cut your loss is, is a wise thing to do. You do not want Trey Lance around to have any particular competition with players who are rated above him and any tension. I'm okay with all of that. What I'm sort of surprised with on a small level is they traded him within the conference to a playoff caliber team that they might have to play. I thought mm. they'd try to trade him out of the conference. What I'm surprised at on a big level was that the Cowboys wanted him because, Pablo, this just adds more drama around <laughs> Dak Prescott. It undercuts <laughs> Dak Prescott in a terrible way. It basically sows the seeds that say internally, we're not crazy about Prescott. And then you find out, I mean, it's a terrible position for Trey Lance to be in because then you find out, wait a second, Jerry Jones didn't tell Dak Prescott, didn't tell Mike McCarthy. What? It's incredible. What? No, Tony, how my can you bring detail, this guy in? My favorite detail is that Jerry said that he made this decision without a thought about Dak Prescott, which is either wildly reassuring or exactly the opposite. How can you not see this through the most obvious lens? And for that reason, I don't actually believe him. But I do want to point something out about Kyle Shanahan and the Niners here, right? Part of the advantage of having a system, Tony, in which you can plug in literally anybody. Brock Purdy, the last pick of the draft, got plugged in, almost took him to a Super Bowl. Part of the whole glory of that is that you have all of these other picks, moves to make, and they've squandered part of their lead schematically, right? They squandered three first rounders that became really good players. Look at who else they picked, those other teams with those picks. Lots of really good guys. And so the gap between the Niners and the Super Bowl might be the gap between Trey Lance and Mac Jones, who they probably could have taken. And so to me, this means make it to a Super Bowl as we're presuming you might. Otherwise, this is going to look even worse as the years go on. But I suppose we should move on 
as they must, to a different story. Because the Jets' new quarterback, Tony, is a guy by the name of Aaron Rodgers. Rodgers made his preseason debut over the weekend, going 5 of 8 over two series, and finishing with a touchdown pass to one Garrett Wilson. And meanwhile, the man replacing Rodgers in Green Bay, Jordan Love, finished his preseason stint in overall 21 of 33 for 193 yards, three touchdowns, and zero picks. So, Tony, whose preseason performance impressed you more here? Was it Rodgers or was it Jordan Love? Let's go back to the theme of trading up to get a quarterback. The Packers traded up to get Jordan Love while Aaron Rodgers was in his prime. There is nothing that Aaron Rodgers basically can do in an exhibition season that's going to be one-tenth as important as what Jordan Love can do. Nobody in New York expected Aaron Rodgers to play a down in the exhibition season. He hadn't played a down in years for Green Bay, so why should he play here? Short of breaking his leg out there, nothing he would do would matter. It's a public relations move. Aaron Rodgers said, I'm going to be very cooperative. I'm not going to be a prima donna. So, you know, that's, that's fine. Jordan Love went out there. Because they're, they're going to, when the bell rings, Pablo, the Jets are going to hand the ball to a Hall of Fame quarterback. And when the bell rings, the Packers are handing it to essentially a rookie. So what Jordan yes. Love has done is a good sign in terms of confidence. Three touchdown passes right, no interceptions, 193 yards. It is, Pablo, it's very possible that the Packers are saying to themselves internally, and they won't crow about it, we're in great shape here. We're good because we've done what we did before when we got rid of Brett Favre and we brought in Aaron Rodgers. It's possible they're saying that. Tony, it's hard not to see this through the lens of hard knocks, because while PTI has been off these past couple weeks, I've been guzzling the propaganda that has been Aaron Rodgers' least favorite show that has become his favorite show now, because he is esteemed as this messianic figure. And through that lens, yeah. I'm like, you know what? I can see this being incredibly, inc and I say this cautiously, incredibly successful. The way that he has won the trust of everybody with the New York Jets, I'm like, okay. I see how this can go well. And for that reason, yeah. I'm going to say Aaron Rodgers because Jordan Love needs to show yeah. me more than a preseason. Aaron Rodgers has won me through propaganda into wanting to watch every game of this team. So for that can reason, just, yeah, give me Rodgers. Can Rogers. I interrupt you? Can I interrupt yeah. you for one second? Did you just use the words Jets and successful in the same sentence I, without even I, a separation I of a clause? Do, I do regret yeah. that now that you You know, like that. you're, you're yeah. going to drink the Kool-Aid on that. I'm not sure. Wilbon's going the other way, as you know. Wilbon hopes they lose Always. every single game. We'll stay with football, but we'll move to college football. Number 13, Notre Dame opened up with essentially a home game in Dublin, stomping Navy 42-3. to Transfer quarterback Sam Hartman. 19 to 23 for 266 yards and four touchdowns. Caleb Williams began the defense of his Heisman with 278 yards and four touchdowns as number six USC beat San Jose State. And USC unveiled true freshman wide receiver Zachariah Branch, who had 232 all purpose yards and two touchdowns, including a 96 yard kick mm. return. So, Pablo, which team's performance did you find more intriguing? I'm taking USC, Tony, and I'll take USC even though I know that their problems are exactly the same as they were last season. They can't really play defense. They gave up a bunch of points, almost 30 to San Jose State. But the reason why I'm intrigued by them is the reason why Caleb Williams is going to go number one overall in next year's draft. That guy is the closest thing to Patrick Mahomes that I have seen since Patrick Mahomes. And so that, plus the Zachariah kid, give me that offense, give me the entertainment value therein. Yeah, I love the fact that it was called Week Zero. I don't know what that means. I wonder if it's like Coke Zero. I don't understand any of it. I'm going to disagree with yeah, you. I'm going to say free. the most intriguing thing is Notre Dame. Notre Dame opened last year 0-2 with a brand-new coach, and opening 1-0 makes a big difference. And they unveiled a new quarterback who played four years, I believe, at Wake Forest. And now yep. this, this is like signing a free agent. This is the closest thing to a baseball free agent that we've seen. The transfer portal has an effect on college football, not unlike the three-point shot in basketball. To me, it changes everything. If you are intrigued with both these teams, if I understand correctly, on October 14th in South Bend, they're going to play. USC mm -hmm. and Notre Dame. That's going to settle a lot of things. Do you know what else is on Notre Dame's schedule this year? They what? got USC at home. They got Ohio State at home, and they are at Clemson. Who comes up with this schedule? <laughs> what AD wants to kill his school 
by having games like that in a row, and you're totally right about UFC in the sense that are you going to make Caleb Williams score 45 points every single Hopefully. game to win the game? Yeah. It's a great point. They are so bad defensively that they are going to give us the entertainment that you just described. An entertainment that is unrivaled by anything in this Notre Dame versus USC head-to-head -head except for Sam Hartman's beard. That beard is magnificent. All natural and By the way, I got the, um, I got the highlight reel on Zachariah Branch, and I've already oh, voted yeah. him for the Heisman. I've already done that. <laughs> that thing's done. Let's take a break. Coming up, Messi scores again, but how should MLS feel about him missing three games to play for Argentina? And is the more compelling story the rise of the Mariners, Tony, or is it the fall of the Rangers? Yeah. I'm glad you feel that way about Aaron Rodgers. Now, he's a great, great quarterback, but the pressure on him is greater than on any other player in the NFL for the first six weeks, don't you think? Tony, on don't the think? show, the, the coaches are asking the players, are, does he like us? All right, it's time for some ESPN2 quality emails. Let me get the first Mail one time. here. I hope these are legible. And the is the bigger deal for Inter Miami and MLS that Messi scored against the Red Bulls, or that we will have to, he will have to miss at least three games for national team duties? Tony, it's the fact that he scored again. He has played in nine games, he scored 11 times, six assists, and the extra special aspect of this one is that this was the first time Inter Miami has won a game because they were in this tournament previously in MLS play since May. And then you look at the quality of the goal, the quality of the assist, the Jordi Alba setup, all of it speaks to how whenever he's playing in games in America, it's appointment right. television. So give me the appointment right. television. Yeah, I think that the much bigger deal, honestly, is that he's going to miss three games. I mean, what if he decides not to come back? What if he goes away and he says this MLS <laughs> thing is just so easy, I don't want to do it? He is the MLS right now. They, the yes. nine games, they're 9-0. and oh. They were 0-400 oh before he got there. He's the only person in the MLS that anyone wants to see. If they don't have him, they may as well sell cat food because nobody <laughs> is going to want to watch this thing without him. So to me, like, I wouldn't let him go. I would be afraid that he's a flight <laughs> risk. I would not let him leave. He's that important. Of course, Tony Kornheiser's brain finds its way around to flight risks when it speaks to the messy story. Yes, all of this is about how can this go catastrophically wrong? Nothing so this. good can ever last. That sounds appropriate. Let's yeah, get, you're thinking. Let's get another one. More compelling story, the rise of the Mariners or the fall of the Rangers? Oh, it's the Mariners for me, Tony. They have the best record in baseball since July 1st. The Texas Rangers, same division, of course, are 1-9 in nine in their last 10. And Julio Rodriguez, it's not just, oh, the Mariners, nice story, a team that never sniffed the postseason for 20 years, made it for the first time last year, backing it again. No, they're doing all of that with a kid who is deeply, deeply exciting. It's the Mariners to me. Yeah, so you're wrong again, because let me just give you sports writing 101. The okay. losing locker room is the better story. That's why Texas this. right now is the better story. It's not really a surprise that the Mariners are back in the playoff chase, because as you say, they made the playoffs last year. They're a really good team. But Texas is now 1-9 in their last 10, even with Corey Seager hitting about 700. Texas was in first place in a tough division, the AL West, for 111 days. Texas yeah. is the only team, I think they're the most surprising team in baseball, and they're the only team that spent a tremendous amount of money that was actually doing well, whereas the Mets and the Padres and the Yankees had gone down the drain. I mean, I think all of these things work in congruence, and it makes Texas the better, the better story. You, don't, you really don't? I mean, if you were I, I writing just, for Sports <laughs> Illustrated, you'd write Texas instead of Seattle. I would write Julio Rodriguez, unless I was Tony Kornheiser, finding misery, finding misery in every <laughs> otherwise sunny story available to me, yes. Have I told you about the cellulitis in my leg? You want to hear about misery? Enough email. Ugh. Let's take one last cellulitis. break still to come. Ellie De La Cruz makes another remarkable throw. And Simone Biles picks up right where she left off.
You're okay though? Pablo, You're okay with this? With Pablo the, with Torrey the... finds out the right answers. That was the name what? of that segment. I tell Finds out how Tony right has answer. cellulitis. Every. Happy time, people. Happy 52nd birthday, Janet Evans. Before there was Katie Ledecky, there was Janet Evans in her prime, the greatest female swimmer in the world. In 1988 in Seoul and in 1992 in Barcelona, Evans won four gold medals and a silver in the 400 freestyle, 800 freestyle, and 400 meter individual medley. In 1987, Evans held world records in the 400, 800, and 1500 meter freestyle distances. In the 1988 Olympics, Evans set a world record in the 400 that stood for 18 years. Her record in the 1500 stood for 19 years, and her record in the 800 went unmatched through four different Olympic Games. But it's another Olympic Games, Tony, that remains seared into my memory, having just revisited it. It's the 96 Atlanta Olympics. She's being interviewed on television, on CNN, when the bomb goes off, you see yeah. the human reaction of Janet Evans, and that, to me, sticks out above everything else. Yeah, so I was down there covering for the Washington Post, and when that happened, as you can imagine, we were all going to pull an all-nighter. The editor flew down from Washington to set up all the coverage. That was an enormous story, mm. and I, too, remember watching on television and seeing Janet Evans in that moment. Happy anniversary, Tiger Woods. On this day, 29 years ago, 18-year-old Tiger Woods became the youngest winner in the history of the U.S. Amateur, winning the last three holes of his 36-hole championship match with Trip Keeney. That was the first of an unprecedented three straight amateur titles by Tiger. The following year, Earl Woods predicted his son would win 14 majors. Tiger had 14 until 2019, when Tiger won the Masters for number 15. Only Jack Nicklaus with 18 has more majors than Tiger, who won each of the four majors at least three times. Nobody else has won more than 11. Walter Hagen got his 11th 94 years ago. You know, Earl Woods and his prophecies about his son, I remember him falling short a little bit, claiming to Gary Smith of Sports Illustrated that his son would have more influence humanitarian-wise than Gandhi and Nelson Mandela. But on the golf stuff, Tony, pretty dead on. Yeah, had that one right. There is no question in any, it should be no question, Jack Nicklaus had the greatest career in the history of golf, and Tiger Woods had the greatest 10 years in the history of golf. They yeah. are the best. They're the best. Happy trails to Curacao in the Little League World Series. The team from the Caribbean nation battled back to tie California at five on a grand slam in the fifth inning of yesterday's final. But in the bottom of the sixth, six foot one inch, Louis Lapp <laughs> ended it in the Americans' favor with a walk-off home run to left. It was the second straight year that Curacao fell in the finals. Last year was to Hawaii. Yeah, a victory lappy, I believe they're calling it across the world right now. But Curacao, shout out to them. 150,000 people in Curacao have made two straight Little League World Series. Is not so bad. 6-1. Come on now. It's a big boy. Large. And a Large bonus lappy. happy trails to Corbin Carroll's attempt at an inside the park home run. The speedy rookie of the Diamondbacks drove a ball off the center field wall in the fifth inning against the Reds, and he got waved home. But Reds rookie Ellie De La Cruz took the cutoff in the shallow outfield. He fired a 99.7 mile per hour throw home to get Carroll at the plate. De La Cruz now has eight <laughs> assists, tracked at 95 miles per hour since he came up in July. Since StatCast started measuring throw speed in 2015, Fernando Tatis Jr. is the next closest player with four. Not this season overall. He's got this since July. Why doesn't yes. he pitch? Thank you for being the shiny new object to distract me from Shohei Otani's torn UCL, Tony, Ellie De La Cruz, the guy who is best at inside the park home runs, running them and stopping them apparently also. It's one of the greatest plays in baseball, an inside the park home run, and to gun somebody down in that makes it an even more memorable play. I don't like most of these statistics, Pablo, but if you tell me that an infielder and an outfielder they're throwing it basically 100 miles an hour. Yep. That's, I'll tune in that, that is really, that's impressive. Let's go to the big finish. Simone Biles won the U.S. Nationals for the eighth time. What are your thoughts? They're simple. She's the greatest of all time. She had the twisties, lost her sense of self, literally and figuratively, in the air the last time we saw her. And now she's back to being, yeah, the best. But Team USA just beat Greece Tony at the FIBA World Cup by 28. 
Does that feel significant to you? Well, Giannis Antetokounmpo did not play in that game, but I think that the United States team is better than people thought. I, I do. I, I think they're going to be I a like fun team, team to watch. Yeah. Josh Jacobs ended his holdout agreeing to a one-year deal worth up to $12 million. Is that significant? Yes and no. No, because it's just about $2 million more than the franchise tag. But yes, because this half-Filipino legend led the NFL in yards from scrimmage and also was the best player on my fantasy team last year. Victor Hovland, meanwhile, won the Tour Championship. Is that a big deal? Your boy. I'm going to rant for a while. That really is a big deal. And not just because he won $18 million. He closed Sundays, two Sundays in a row, with a 61 and a 63 to win tournaments. That's such a big deal. And I can't get it out of my head that he's from Norway. How do you grow up in Norway thinking <laughs> I can be a golf pro when golf courses are probably open three months a year? I mean, yeah. props to Victor Hovland, honestly. Fjords. Last one, Lots the Brewers yours. have won eight straight. Do you like him to beat the Cubs tonight? I do, much to Will Bond's chagrin. Wade Miley, 3.18 ERA, he's 6-3. He's pitching against Jameson Tyon, who is not nearly as good. So give me the Brew Crew, despite the electric shock I feel in the screen right now. We're out of time. We'll try and do better the next time. I'm Tony Kornheiser. And I'm Pablo Torre. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing to Pablo Torre Finds Out. It's a podcast with this URL. It's free. But for now, so I I have this old thing. So, but th- th- this is that no still good. Works. That still works. So it's you can visit Pablo that. Toro finds up. out. When do yes. you find out? What time? Well, we'll have to find out, out. together.